Hello and welcome back to the second of this afternoon's live sessions at the Good Intelligence Biometric Summit 2021. I'm joined by Clive Bork, president of EMEA and APAC at Dayon, for discussion on the road to recovery with digital wellness credentials. Biometrics is being used as a key technology for the pandemic recovery, and there was a great deal of activity around the world with digital wellness credentials. I'll let Clive give you more detail on the topic and introduce the panelists. If you have a question for any of the panelists during the session, then please submit them using the Q&A facility, and then we will endeavor to get to all of your questions. But as this is a very hot topic, we may have to answer some of the questions after the session finishes. Thank you, Clive. Very good. Um, thanks and welcome everybody to, to this session. Uh, thanks to Good Intelligence for setting up and thanks to all the panelists for joining. Um, so uh, my name is Clive Burke. I'm president of Me in Asia. As Alan mentioned, we're the company that developed uh, the Verify application, which is uh, one of the uh, digital wellness uh, passport solutions that's out there and being used in the travel industry. And by no means today in our Q&A are we going to focus just on, on the Verify. We're going to talk more generally. We actually have a great panel, which I'll uh, let them introduce in a second, and we're going to go through uh, a number of different topics. So we're going to talk about, uh, to start with, the emergence of the COVID-19 variants and what the impact that has been. We're going to talk about uh, digital wellness credentials themselves, like what they really are, what they mean to people and so on in terms of definitions, regulatory uh, considerations and so on. And then we're going to talk about the impact on the stakeholders within the travel industry and then we're going to talk beyond travel and say, where else are we seeing these uh, wellness credentials being used and talk about the confusion about wellness credentials to unlock internal economies and unlock international travel. So that's what we're going to do. So what I might do to start with is uh, I'll start the introductions. I'll ask each panel member to introduce themselves. So Chris, if you go first, then Maura, then Scott, if we go do intros. Thanks, Clive. Uh, my name is Chris Meegan. I'm uh, the Director of Strategic Relationships with Hume Brophy. Um, I've been working with Hume Brophy for just over 10 years now, primarily in the transport and aviation fields. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here today. I'm Maura Walsh. I work for Enterprise Ireland. We're the venture and trade arm of the Irish government, and I oversee our travel technology portfolio of companies. Thanks, Maura. My name's Scott Sunderman. I'm the Managing Director of Collinson Medical Services. We run the COVID airport testing centres at Heathrow, Manchester, Stansted, Luton, uh, London City, Gatwick, O2, East Midlands, and a range of other airports. Very good. Thanks, Scott. And uh, Michelle, I believe that we have <clears throat> a number of uh, questions that we can run for surveys. Do you want to run them now or do we run them as we run through the session? So here's the first question. And we thought we'd run a few questions to allow the audience to answer. So, and the panelists can't vote for this, but if the um, audience could look at those questions and see if they want to offer up answers to any of those. Uh, the first one is, do you know the difference between a digital wellness credential, a COVID cert, a vaccine passport and health passports? And so yes, no, or I'm confused. But what we might do is while people are voting there, um, oh, I see there's already a result in. So there's a yes to, um, digital wellness credentials and it's oh it's shifting around this is like the Eurovision where you see the results from the end of time <laughs> so I wonder if we're settled on the first question that's still moving around I'll tell you what we'll do is we'll we'll keep an eye on that as we go through and then we'll kick off so what I wanted to do first was talk a little bit about um digital wellness credentials, and then the impact of the new variants on the recovery plans. So um, first of all, from a digital wellness credential, there's been a lot of talk recently, including the Prime Minister in the UK saying, this is something we ought to look at. Some of the senior government cabinet figures there are saying, well, we need to look at this option. Uh, there's been talk from the White House and Biden in the US saying, this is something that needs to be considered, but it might be executed privately. There's the digital green search in the EU. Um, and then there's a readiness of the member states to, to come in and deal with that. So, but before we get into that, like open to the panelists, and we start with you, Chris, what do you think the emergence of the new COVID variants has done in terms of the pandemic, our reaction to the pandemic, people's perceptions, and the question of the, of the panel, really the road to recovery? 
Uh, well, that's a, it was quite a lot in that question, I suppose. Yeah, really. I I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll leave some of it to my other panellists. Uh, but I, I think it's very clear, if we look at it purely from the transport prism, the emergence of the, um, the variant, particularly the UK variant, um, which came, really kind of came to light around last November, December, um, that's very much set things back quite considerably, you know, in terms of trying to, to drive forward a recovery. Um, there was an awful lot of work done by the member states and the European Commission in Europe, and uh, you know, in particular, in the lead up to last November, and this included guidance to um, you know the member states in terms of how to to use testing protocols to facilitate people getting back on uh, on planes and into international travel. All of that was really pushed back several steps with the emergence of the variant and the acknowledgement that with a variant you're, you're very much dealing with a new disease. And there's a whole different issue that has to be dealt with there. So it has slowed things down in terms of recovery. And it's something I think that when you look at the, even if you look at the details of the uh, digital green certificate that's come forward, that it's been taken into account. There's a great deal of flexibility within that framework. And that kind of acknowledges, I suppose, that there is a risk of variance and that's going to continue for some time. And so any systems and uh, policies that are adopted now in response to the pandemic have got to be flexible enough to adapt to those variants as they emerge. Very good, Chris. Thanks, that's exactly right. Um, and uh, Scott, we might throw the same question at you. Sure, I, I think my concern is is for the very long term. I think, um, you know, there's some, there's parts of the world that are, are doing very, very well in terms of vaccination and, you know, the feeling, you, know, you, you see it in, in England and parts of the UK where, you know, vaccination rates are high, we can now, all go out and have a good time. A lot of you would have seen the media kind of yesterday. Um, but but the concern that I have is that the vast majority of the world still isn't um, isn't anywhere near um, high vaccination rates now, and particularly countries like Brazil, where you know you have 250 million people living on top of each other, and number of variants already running rapidly, you know, throughout the population. The P1 variant there is is impacting a, a very large percentage of young people. In fact, half of all people in intensive care in Brazil right now are under 40. Um, so, so these variants are starting to, because they're so transmissible, starting to hit a much younger population. So I think the, the concern that I have is that we're going to be dealing with the disease for, for a long, long time now. And so, um, so you know, as Chris was saying, we, we need to build infrastructure and processes to, to live with it. Very good. Very yeah, good. I, Sorry, go yeah. ahead, Mark. I was just going to say, I totally agree with that. I think the consensus, you know, especially from travel stakeholders, is that it will be around for a while. Um, and it will be super important that we have tools to really help us get back to travel and get back to normal. And it's, it's going to be a new normal. There's no doubt about that. But we definitely do need the tools and the infrastructure to make things work again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, well, let's, um, before we move on to, you know, wellness credentials and those tools, uh, uh, guys, let's go over and have a look at the poll results and see what it's telling us from the audience. So uh, back to that first question, you can see, do you know the difference between the different types? And we're going to talk about that again in a few minutes. But so it's a yes, no, and I'm confused spread. And even 15% said I'm confused is not a great um it's not a great situation, but uh, no, is not. Forty-six percent is not good either. So, um, certainly a lot more could be done there. I'm going to come on to that and say what could be done. Now, the next one is really interesting. Right, would you be willing to use the app to gain access to a venue for a concert or sporting event? And there's a huge percentage of people who said yes. So that's interesting. So obviously, those tools that you guys referenced, actually, an app being one of the tools, if you like. Um, that would make a big difference to recovery because once we get people back to those big public events, we're going to feel like we're back in some sense, aren't we? So and, uh, it's been a while since any of us have done anything like that. I'm sure we're all craving a match concert or some sort of gathering. Now, what about business travel? Same percentage again. Yes, 81% for business travel, which is interesting. But there's also 20%, 19% who are not sure, which is, which is interesting because we really can't have a situation where 20% uh, of people are not sure whether it's safe to travel or whether they might travel and stuff like that. That means we haven't really succeeded in dealing with the pandemic as a group. doesn't mean the tools aren't right. It just means we haven't dealt with properly. Now let's talk about leisure. And uh, actually slightly higher people would travel for leisure. 
So that's interesting. I wonder is that indicative of our interest in traveling again for leisure from a mental health perspective or otherwise. And there's actually a few people who've said definitely nowhere, which is interesting as well. Um, and if vaccine were widely adopted, would you consider attending conferences and stuff like this? So conferences aren't everybody's cup of tea. Some find them great, some don't really want to go to them. And here we have a very high percentage again who would go to conferences, which is uh, interesting. So you're talking about 77% to 85% of people who would consider um, real large public gatherings for business or for leisure or for travel purposes, which is really interesting. Very good. Okay, what we might do then is we'll stop sharing those results and uh, we'll move back to um, um, we'll move back to the questions. So, the digital wellness credential itself, there's ones that there's the term vaccine passport, there's health passport, there's COVID certificates, and there's digital wellness credential, which in, in itself is a huge mouthful, right? Um, do you think it's confusing? Like, do you want to make your own comments on this, starting with you, Scott? What do you think about all that and where we should kind of focus the focus, if you like? I, I think it's definitely confusing. I think that's a real problem um, because it means that it's going to stop adoption, you know, particularly the use of terms like vaccine passports. And of course, what we're, not, what we're talking about are, are not vaccine passports, they're health passports, you know, the, the, a way to certify that you have either you know, antibodies to COVID or you have taken COVID tests. Um, but when you start using the word vaccine passport, people associate that with purely taking a vaccine and that turns a large percentage of the population off, I think. So so I think terminology and, and naming conventions are important. I think standards are important too, and that's been one of the real problems with the pandemic to date, um, both within, you know, the, the United Kingdom and, and you know, globally, you know, the, the lack of common standards has meant that we've really struggled as a global population to deal with this. You know, the, the range of standards across the world, both in terms of testing, in terms of regulation, and in terms of you know now these these uh, uh, passports is is uh, makes life life difficult, confusing for the for the public in general. It does make a huge difference. And um, one of the things that we find with Verify is that the name and purely um, not taking credit for this, but the name really helps people understand what it's doing. You know, you, I know we're working with yourselves on that, Scott. Um, yes, indeed. Maura, um, what would you would care to comment on this topic? Yeah, I think, um, you know, again, Scott had really good points. I think when we talk about vaccine passports, it actually, um, I think it creates a lot of fear. Um, you know, in the US, there's been a lot of talk around data privacy just because there's vaccine and passport. Um, interestingly enough, actually, yesterday I was on an international flight and unfortunately the airline was not using Verifly and it was really interesting. You know, I uploaded my negative test through the app, the airline app, but then I got to the airport and er like there was so much confusion because every single person had to go up to the counter again after your connecting flight. Um, um, and I think one of the big issues is, as, a, as you think of travel coming back, is just all this extra time that's needed if the tech is not in place. Um, so I think that's why it's important to have some of these credentials in place. And I think the digital wellness or the health credential, um, you know, and definitely we do need, um, you know, global standards um, around the issue. And I think that will help as well with adoption. Absolutely, we definitely need. To. I think everybody's coming coming in on that theme of, of standards. And Chris, from your perspective, well, I, I think I'd echo exactly what Scott and Maura have just said. Um, I think the language that we use when we talk about these things is very important. And and you know, using the word passport, it, it draws a certain focus to this, um, which is incorrect in terms of what it is trying to achieve and how it is going to work. I think the devil is in the detail. Of course, when you get into these proposals and you look at these measures, um, you know. And one thing, of course, is that not only is this an evolving situation, but it's a situation where there is no blueprint out of this and, and we are kind of making it up as we go along. But to a large degree, they're doing a very good job of that. Um, but I think people have to understand as well that as these discussions and as these policies evolve, then, you know, we get a greater understanding of it and the language then changes. Certainly, we did talk about this and it was widely discussed vaccine passport um, in, in light of the problem 
and it was the right language to use in light of the problem that was being addressed. But of course, it's moved on from that since. And, you know, we can't kind of be, be anchored to that term anymore because that is actually very counterproductive at this point. Um, but again, when you get into the details of the measures being looked at, you can see there's, there's much, much more to it than that. And there's a lot of safeguards in place and all the rest. I think, to be honest with you, that the confusion that we're seeing and that's reflected in the poll that, you're there, that you've uh, put up there, Clive, is actually reflected maybe in some of the, the questions that have pointed out later on, particularly around the fact that, you know, it's important really that we should be educating people and bringing them along around what these solutions might be, because there's a huge, and you can get into a massive debate, which today is maybe not the day to do it, around misinformation and so forth on the internet and all the rest around coronavirus and COVID and, and what's happening and what isn't. But again, if we are going to drive forward solutions and if we are going to see them work, then what we need to make sure we're doing is developing that trust with consumers and users and bringing them along with us as well. Very good, very good. Um, I might uh, remind the audience if they want to throw up questions for the panel, uh, our, our experts, uh, we're happy to take them as we go. Um, but in the meantime, Chris, I, I'm going to come back to you because you are a regulatory specialist, government affairs in Europe. You do know what's happening with the Commission and the different agencies and some of the member states. And in relation to the digital green certificate, while we all welcomed that news when we saw it, then the first question to challenge you on, but will it be ready? Well, I suppose where there's political will, there's a way. Um, you know, there's, there's promising elements of this, you know, I think, you know, and, and again, we can kind of trace a, a path on this. If we go back to January, there's a sort of a, a maybe a cautious approach being taken by the heads of state um, to this whole area. By the time we get to March, the, the, the landscape has changed and now they've brought forward a motion to say that this has to be brought in as an urgent procedure. So, you know, we can see things are evolving as we go. Uh, the European Parliament has, has uh, applied the urgent procedure to this. Now, really, things are going to kick off next month. Um, at that point, we're going to have a mandate for negotiation between the Council and the Parliament and things will move forward. We've already seen the warning flags, the shots across the bow in terms of where the areas of contention will be. And, and you know, they're down to fundamental rights, they're down to privacy and so forth as well. But for the most part, these are things which can be addressed. And I do think that the proposal from the Commission is very cognizant of that, has included certain elements in that that will really address those concerns, I, I, I would imagine. I, I do think they're going to be pushing this through. Um, I, I would worry, however, and I think it's important that everybody does understand this, that you know, it is a tool and it is going to be available for member states. And we can talk about how that might or might not work. But we have to look at it from the context of the situation in Europe at the moment as a third wave is really tearing across the continent. And so you know, that recognition is also there from the member states that their focus is, of course, on protecting their own populations and, and you know, responding to that health emergency. But at the same time, they're moving forward because they recognize this is an important tool and system to put in place, and it is going to be necessary as time goes by. And, and Chris, it, so that's, that's the, let's say, the legislative and the legal framework and the political will and the collaboration from the member states. We still then have to execute on that strategy, right? So there's probably stuff that needs to be done by various IT departments of the commission and then stuff that needs to be done by health service IT of the member states. Would that be fair? Well, there is. And, and you know, if there's, I suppose when we think about the proposal, there's really sort of two elements to it, um, you know, which is obviously the main driving piece, the, the digital green certificate. And then there's another piece which sits alongside it and not, not related to European citizens, but rather from foreign nationals that live in Europe and so on. Um, but then behind that, again, there's secondary legislation, which is the implementing legislation. And that's where we really get into the technical detail about how this is going to be achieved. And so that is actually usually what you would find is the primary legislation goes through first and then subsequently they deal with the implementing legislation afterwards. But that's not the case here because of the urgent procedure, because of the fact they need to get this done quickly. They're actually both going in a parallel track. And that's quite unusual. But again, it reflects the situation we're in at the moment. So those discussions at that technical level, that working group level between the member states are ongoing as we speak. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And it's, it's still, so it's great that they're in lockstep in sense, the technical guidance and also the, the, the legislation itself. But still at the same time, we then need uh, people to pick up and implement those tools, make them available and have whatever technology and local legal changes that might be needed in order to have the member states because the digital green cert lives and falls in every member state actually 
delivering on it, right? So yeah, and and you know, look, there'll be different degrees of readiness, and there'll be different degrees of willingness to push things forward. And, you know, will everybody move in step once this is adopted at a European level? That's something we we can't say with any degree of certainty. I, I would find it hard to believe everybody will move, you know, completely uh, in step. But I think we will have certain countries that are either in a position to move quite quickly or else have a significant will to do so. And, you know, in many cases, we look at the southern European states that are really pushing for this from a tourism perspective. And they're saying they're going to move very quickly on it. Again, all of this has to be looked at through the prism of the public health uh, situation as well. Very good. Very good. Um, more like, so the, Chris has given a good ex uh, explanation of where the digital green cert is from an EU perspective. And we know they're working with the WHO as well. So, um, but from an, like based on the West Coast where you are, what's the perception perspective on the EU, this EU development? Well, I guess, um, you know, on the West Coast, there's not a whole lot of talk, you know, or in, in the travel industry itself in the US about the, you know, the green digital, um, you know, and I think mostly because there's so many options out there already. And, you know, I think the US has been fortunate when you think of vaccine rollout. And if you look at even the TSA numbers, the numbers of people that are flying, you know, since April 8th has been virgin on 1.5 million every day. Um, you have major travel um, sellers like Airbnb, VRBO, they don't have enough supply for the amount of demand. So what we're seeing in the US is actually a huge surge in demand for travel. Um, that is not international at this stage. And that's, I think, really where it could come into play um, a little bit more. Um, but I do think what we're going to have is, you know, the airlines in particular, you know, they're already working with key st stakeholders like Verfly. So, you know, I think you know, the digital green um, credential, I think for Europeans, you know, may work, you know what I mean? Because airlines will probably want to do um, uh, partnerships there. But I think from a, you know, a perspective, I think we're still going to have a few different types um, and they, and it's going to be all about execution. You know, I think my fear is um, when it's all different countries and we can see just even in you know, unfortunately, the rollout of some of the other stuff related to COVID, it's, it's not been successful. Um, so I guess the big question is around execution. The big question is around execution. And apologies for calling it the digital green certificate from, because there's also the green pass from Israel and there's, you know. Yeah, there's the, so many. The green has been grabbed for a few reasons as well, for yeah. sure. Um, um, Scott, a uh, slightly different angle on the same question. Like there's been an evolution in, what the expectations are around COVID testing. And, you know, Collins and Group, that's part of what you do is trying to address test to depart, test to arrive, and, and then the different test types. So would you like to see it, comment on those changes? Yeah, sure. I think, I mean, the, I think there's good news in terms of the evolution of testing. So, um, you know, it's, it's getting faster and cheaper. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing quite recently a, a, a big reduction in the cost of tests like PCR, for example. So it's becoming cheaper for people to use those for traveling. Tests like PCR still take a long time to get results. And so there's still an impediment there, but we're also seeing tests get faster. So um, the rapid, rapid testing technologies are becoming more accurate, more reliable, and therefore more suited to things like travel. Um, so I think as we progress, even though there's going to be an abundance of caution initially, countries will move more and more to cheaper, faster means of getting people moving and we'll head towards a new normal where, you know, these things almost become normalized. And, and because of that, you need to find fast, cheap ways of doing it. And Scott, do you think that um, tests at home is going to become a greater percentage of the tests in t later 2021? Or do you think it lowers? Um, I think domestically, for sure. Um, I think domestically, for sure. It, it, it certainly has a big role to play in controlling the pandemic and infection locally. I think the big problem is obviously around certification to travel overseas. Um, so, you know, somebody can sit at home and take a lateral flow device and come with a, a negative result, but how do you prove that to a border guard um, when you're trying to cross into another country? And that, that, that to me is the big issue. Um, so that, you know, it's gonna require 
um, you know, some some technology to help, I think, verify the test and then obviously health passports like Verify to to help to prove um, the, the, the result as you cross borders. And I guess the, you know, the, 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 the seamless experience from a passenger perspective would be if they could go from declaring their health credentials to getting the test and all that, have that all seamlessly surface back at departure and on arrivals, right? So that yeah. you could use that evidence through an app. And I'm not saying the Verify app, but an app like Verify or any of the other apps that you could actually then, the pass, at least from the passenger's perspective, they would be able to initiate the test, get the test in a timely fashion, have it from a, rep, a reputable lab or through a test provider like yourselves, and then have it surfaced at the airport to allow check-in, but also surfaced on arrival. So the border force of wherever your destination is, say, will accept that app evidence of that test, right? And stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, very, very true. And I, I kind of see it uh, that potentially it's going to turn, you know, follow the same sort of history that security did in air travel there. You know, we all remember, well, I remember anyway, <laughs> a time when security was, was quite lax and then um, you know, had a, a series of, of terrorist events and and then it became the new normal. You know, you went through a, quite a, a rigorous security process before you get on an aeroplane. And I think, you know, th this will potentially be quite similar if we do see COVID continuing into the future for some time, like a, like a flu, for example, then we might see a lot of this stuff become normalised and it will just become part of the routine uh, to go on an aeroplane like like a security check. Yeah, well, I totally actually... agree with that. Yeah, I, I was just going to add as well, you know, one thing that's not being talked about is currently airports all over the world are, once demand comes back fully, there's a lot of concern about there's going to be bottlenecks everywhere. So, you know, we've seen it at Heathrow, we've seen it at airports in the US where there's people waiting up to three hours. So we really need that technology just to smooth, you know, the whole travel journey and to make it, make it seamless as Clive talked about. And even speaking to events as well, we're seeing in San Francisco, you know, for the, the Giants opener um, last week, you had to show either your vaccination card or a negative test. So how are we going to make all these events more seamless as well? Um, so definitely a few different. And, you know, on that topic, um, Maura, do you, the, you're, you're talking to a lot of people in the aviation industry, and that's one of your main specialities. Um, what do you see as the difference in attitudes or recovery situation between the U.S. and some of the rest of the world? Because it feels to me like you've got all these people that you mentioned earlier are flying in the US now and the recovery is happening. But then we have, for various reasons, including public policy, a much, a very, very, like, less, still, still a very small percentage of people traveling, you know, over, over here. And then there's the rest of the world as well. So what are you seeing? Yeah. Yeah, so, de so definitely in the US, um, you know, demand is back. It's not where definitely where it was before. Um, and there's a consensus that to really, you know, you know, instill confidence because not every person is still is confident yet to travel. You know, there's a segment of the market, but to instill further confidence, um, you know, the whole aviation industry realizes that there needs to be the digital health credential. Um, you know, I think public policy, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because um, it seems many governments were actually afraid to set any standards, you know, you know, throughout the, all of this for travel in particular. And I think that has actually caused bottlenecks. Um, you know, and back to that, you know, earlier we talked about how it's really important that there's a kind of a global standard, even when it comes to the stuff like the digital wellness credentials. Um, you know, I think the one thing that the aviation industry sees as um, a challenge for the, for the year ahead is there's a general feeling that, you know, the European summer is lost. Um, and that's really big when you think of travel, um, you know, because of the new variants, but also, you know, I hate to say this, there's a, a feeling I think in the US that, the, you know, the whole European situation was handled badly. Um, and I think there's, you know, just the restarting international travel is going to be more challenging and it may take a, a little bit longer. 
Well, certainly more the 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 fact that you know the rollout of the vaccine in the U.S. Uh, you know, as Biden said, anybody who wants the job can get the job. Uh, the rollout, the successful rollout in the U.K. Um, there there is a big difference with the rest of Europe, and and so I don't want to say it was handled badly or not, but certainly it's 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 real it's a real challenge for people that you know they look at these other countries and say, well, look how far advanced they are with the vaccine rollout, and look where we are. And I know it's to do with supply as well. It's not as simple. Yeah, yeah, for it, sure. Th yeah. There's no simple answer, but I think you know when you think of countries like Spain, France, and Italy, you know, forty percent of Italy's GDP is from travel and tourism. Um, so it's just going to cause a lot of pain unfortunately you know for you know that the airlines all the way down to the small B&B owner um you know so that's you know anything we can do to just kick start that obviously all with the measure of public safety you know comes first um but you know definitely um just in some confidence again and just people feeling like they can be in an, at an event that's small and you know that you're there and everyone has tested negative um is it's going to be important, especially absolutely. for events as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Chris, I might come back to you on that, actually saying, you know, um, which are the stakeholders who are actually making a difference? Who are facilitators? Who are passengers? Who are actually making, you know, bringing solutions forward, executing on those solutions? I think we talked earlier about regardless of strategy, execution is key. So, Chris, what's your view on that? In terms of at the moment in Europe, who are the main? Well, stakeholders? I would say like which which stakeholders are involved in shaping policy? Which ones are actually involved in executing policy? And which ones are really waiting yeah. for an answer? Look, it's 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 a very again it, we're in a really unprecedented uh, a, a time here. Do you know what I mean? And you know we can say that until we're blue in the face, and but it doesn't change the fact we are in in a situation which is really we've never been here before. There's great empathy towards the transport and tourism sectors in terms of the economic damage that has been suffered as a result of the pandemic, which came out of nowhere. Um, and I think when you talk to stakeholders, political stakeholders, they, they very, you know, they truly understand the, the problems facing these companies and all the employees that work with these companies and the, the other economic entities that rely upon those businesses to operate and so forth. Everybody really, really appreciates and feels, you know, very bad about that. But having said that, you know, the public health argument is in control here, hands down. You know, everything else is secondary to that, you know, and that's something that really has to be taken into account. Um, so all these measures, all these policy measures, yes, they have a role to play in restarting aviation, but they are being brought forward as public health measures. You know, the, the people in control here are the policy makers on the public health side. And so, you know, that has to be taken into consideration. And, you know, what we do see is sometimes, you know, for example, some, um, you know, some voices or some, some lobbying that is coming from some of those sectors, the transport and tourism sector, in some ways is, is a little bit counterproductive as a result. Do you know what I mean? And that has to be taken into consideration as well. The key things we're looking at at the moment, again, and, and you know, there's a huge amount of detail in the digital green certificate that has come from the European Commission. You know, it's not just about vaccines. This is also a mechanism to track the testing results. It's also a mechanism that can track the existence of antibodies, you know. So it, it, it is there, it is to facilitate, you know, um, uh, a broader scope and, and, you know, to touch on different elements, whether or not it can be used, for example, not just for travel, but also for access to sporting or cultural events. That is something which is available as well. As I said, there's great flexibility in it. We are, of course, also looking towards the WHO and, and the role of the WHO is absolutely central to all of this. And they're meant to be coming forward in May with their guidance about the use of vaccine uh, certificates in terms of the travel uh, and, and other events and how they could be used from a societal perspective. Um, so that's a key you know, part of this as well. And we need to keep an eye on where that goes also. So you have all these different bodies and, and they're all doing different things. and and where possible, they're trying to make sure that everything is interoperable and we can all work on an agreed set of standards. And that's really important as well. And I think that's really probably what you're looking at in terms of the you know, transport stakeholders as well, is to keep advocating for that common set of standards. You know I mean, to make sure that if a region or a country is moving forward in something you know, in this space, to make sure that it can talk to those other systems as well and that we can all work together. Because a solution that is you know, restricted to one country is not a huge amount of good when we talk about international transport. You know, it has to work at both ends. So, you know, that is a role that they're playing. And to be perfectly fair to every, you know, 
stakeholder on the transport side that I've spoken to, they are advancing that and they're talking to the public health officials, you know. But, you know, we need to really always keep in mind that despite, you know, acknowledging the pain and the suffering that has been suffered by the transport and tourism sectors, this is still a public health issue and, and that's where the control is. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that actually is a, it, you raised a good point there, like what's the difference between, you know, um, a PCR test, uh, you know, a vaccine, uh, an antibody test, in terms of which of those elements or combinations would be suitable for travel. So Scott, do you have a view on that? You're heavily involved in testing at Collins and so you kind of probably do have a view on it. So I'll open that door to you. I think I, I think that's uh, as as kind of most of us have said earlier. That's that's this is the big problem with international travel at the moment. It certainly was you know at the end of last year um, into early this year that the the lack of standards, common standards, international is a real problem for people traveling. Um, you know, you can be going to countries next door to each other and have completely different um, requirements in terms of the types of tests, the type of um, the, the type of process you have to go through to get the test, the type, the type of certification you need. Um, and you know, that, that continues to this day that there's kind of no movement to get towards a common set of standards because you're right, we should be able to say, okay, if you have either you know, a test you know, be it a, a PCR test or a lab test or an you know, antigen test, um, you or you uh, you've had a vaccine, or you can prove that you've got antibodies to um, to the virus through a, um, an antibody test. Um, then that should be sufficient to get you um, you know where you need to go. Um, but right now, as I said, there, there is just no common set of standards um, to allow that. And, the, and we see, you know, the amount of confusion in the airports is, is, is a real problem. You know, we have people coming along who don't understand the type of tests required to get into the places they're going. And often that will stop somebody from traveling. If somebody turns up and says, I'm getting on a plane in two hours and I need a PCR test, which actually takes 24 hours to, to receive, then that person isn't flying, and, and that's a very common problem at the moment. And is the, what is the what is the minimum round trip for someone needing a PCR test from saying I want to test to actually having a test result in their hand they can take to the airport? Like how long? What's the what's the minimum amount of time someone needs? Is it twenty four hours? It depends on the the method of distribution, and um, you know it, it can be very very quick. I mean, a PCR test can typically take five or six hours to run an assay. It can take twice that um, amount of time if there's a problem running the assay, which is fairly frequent with, with PCR. So we say, you know, within 24 hours, we should be able to get a result. Um, and, but that's a face-to-face -face test where somebody comes into a center, takes a swab, and we process that. One of the big problems with the industry at the moment is the distribution of those tests to people at home, for example. So you were talking about um, you know, home testing earlier. Well, a, a real problem at the moment, um, and, and this is very, very common, is you know, people who rely on the mail network and on um, other logistics networks to take their test to the lab once it's been processed. And, and most countries require you to be swamped um, you know, no more than 72 hours before you leave the country. So that means you've got to take a swab mail the, um, the sample into the lab and get a result within 72 hours. And, and you know, the, the, you know, the, the mail and logistics systems are, are not coping with that issue. And so we have many, many people coming into our test centers panicking because they've not received their result yet from mail order because of the logistics problems. Interesting, interesting. And I saw, you know, that if you're uh, traveling to the US, even if you're a US citizen, and even if you have a vaccine and you're a US citizen, you're returning to the US, you still need a negative PCR test, negative COVID test proof coming back as well. But, you know, the pressure is going to come on public policymakers to change that. And it's likely that probably you can either travel on a vaccine or on a negative COVID test or on a negative antibody test, right? And, and that's probably where, do you see that's where it's ending up, Scott? I'm not asking to be a yeah. public policy. No, no, I, I, for, for sure I do. And, and that's the way it should be. That's a sensible way. But, but I think, as I said, every country is different and, and some of them are taking a pragmatic approach and others are not. Um, and you know, until there's consistency, it, it, it will be a problem for the traveling public. 
Very good. Well, look, um, I, uh, oh, but there's some questions coming in from the audience, so I'm going to uh, read one of those to you now and uh, put it out to the panel. So one of them is um, the digital health credential is not come is not what the travel industry wants as per the World Travel and Tourism Council recommendations. The travel sector only wants the minimum amount of information associated with the vaccine or test search as required for travel, uh, travel clearances dictated by government. They do not want broader health information and discourages the use of health passports. So there's kind of a question and a comment uh, wrapped up there. And it is a great point, uh, Scott. Uh, we'll go back to you on this. Really what we're saying here is it's not about a health passport. It's really about a COVID test or a COVID vaccine, right? And how do we fix that? Yeah, yeah no, I, I completely agree with the, with the sentiment. Um, the, the difficulty is, and again, it comes down to common standards within governments. You know, certain governments require more information than others before they will accept the validity of a test certificate. Um, you know, we see some countries where actually, you know, I'm sure I could wave a, a packet of bubble gum as I go past the border guard and it's fine. You know, um, and some countries in Europe are like that. Um, others, Hong Kong, Japan, actually are completely the opposite. You need a massive amount of information both about the test and about the tester and the testee before you get across the border. And, and, and so it's that dichotomy of requirement that, that again is difficult um, right now. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it, as well, it depends on the stakeholder, you know, like in, in the US, for example, I know there's a big push from the alternative accommodation sector um, you know, hosts of houses that they actually, you know, the people that are coming to stay in their house they would like proof of that the person has been vaccinated or is negative. So I think it really depends. I think it adds another layer, but if that layer leads to more demand and recovery um, and us being in a new normal, I think people are happy to, um, you know, live with that because it's necessary. I would say though that I guess you know one thing, and, and again, this where the where the health passports do come into it is that you know you guys can collect, and I mean verify, and others can collect a vast amount of information, but protect that information and then make sure you know the people who are using that information only see the valid bit, which is COVID negative. If I could come in on, on just on the specifically on the European side in terms of the digital uh, green certificate on this, just to respond to to the question. Um, I, I think the concern that's been raised there is very much reflected in that text, in that really, you know, the view they've taken is that the likes of an airline doesn't need to see all this information in terms of, you know, the health information of the individual or so forth. All they need to see is a yes, no, or, you know, a green or red, as the case may be. And that is it. And they're limiting um, the, the certificate in that regard. So that the, the, you know, when you present your certificate, the only thing that's being you know, checked is that whether or not the certificate is valid. You're not checking the underlying information. That's all done at the member, you know, at the government level, at the member state level, when they're issuing the certificate itself. All you're doing is authenticating the certificate. So it, it, there's no reason for a company like that, whether it's a sporting body, whether it's a museum, or whether it's a, a theater or an airline. Do you mean there is simply no need for them to have access to the health information of the of the individual? And, and and, and Chris, I would add, they don't want access to that information, you know, and that's why we have great players like Verify that can be that middle, you, you know what I mean, that middle ground for everyone. Absolutely, yeah, and, and, and you know, certainly- So that the information not, is transferred safely and protected. Um, but yeah, definitely airlines and other stakeholders, they don't want access. What I would say as well is that uh, the airlines and, and the other stakeholders right now, because they're the touch point with the passengers and they're the point of engagement, it's the way that governments can execute on their policy. So saying, Mr. Airline, you're responsible for validating X, Y, or Z of the passenger, and we want you to have evidence of that as well. And then the second control point is the border force on arrival. So obviously you don't want to be telling people on arrival and, and turning them back. So one of the things with Verifly we really focus on is making sure that nobody got, by the time you traveled, if you traveled with Verifly, you weren't going to arrive at a border and discover the policy had changed and therefore you were no longer eligible to travel and so on. Um, another good question came in and I encourage the audience to keep giving questions. So this one is um, 
uh, I'll go back to you on this one, Chris. Um, how are we going to create globally trust, reliable COVID credentials when there's dozens of players pitching unique approaches to government and enterprises across the world? It seems to me that, and this is from the questioner, uh, seems to me that many for profits are competing for market share. Could this ex- should this whole exercise be done with non-profit? So I'll throw that open to the panel, but we'll start with you, Chris, and then come to uh, you, and then Scott. Well, you know, there's, there's, again, like you know, there's a couple of parts in this. Uh, you know, we, we, it's been quickly identified in the discussion in the debate that um, what we do need here is some degree of common standards. We need a sort of a common level that we're all working at um, in order to make sure that we can. Um, you know, recognize each other's certificates and so forth. And, and that would facilitate travel from an international perspective. Um, and when we think about Europe and those 27 countries in particular at the moment, what we're seeing with the Digital Green Certificate is really, you know, the emergence of the response to that. Because, you know, Europe in particular on the travel side of things really didn't handle um, the, 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 the pandemic very well in terms of very fragmented, uh, you know, approach, closing of borders, this type of thing. And it's it's widely acknowledged that wasn't done correctly. So as we're moving to a point where we're seeing, you know, populations starting to get vaccinated and, and the issuance of these credentials, and this is where the certificate comes in, is to create that common level from a European perspective. Now, what they are doing, of course, as well, they have their eye towards the international dimension. They want to make sure that it will plug in. Part of that is about the fact that maybe they're moving a little bit faster and given the market share they've got across 27 possible member states, you're talking about a big block region now, they might be able to sort of encourage. And, you know, when you look at some of the literature around it, they are actively saying we should be encouraging other countries when they develop up solutions that it can plug into this one as well uh, and, and vice versa as well. And then, of course, when we start looking at systems like where the WHO is going to go on this, that will have a bearing on it as well. Again, there's flexibility within the framework itself to allow them to tweak the elements of that about what information needs to be gathered in order to to um, to to develop up their certificate and so forth. But it is, you know, the the interoperability of data, the ability to work across common standards. These are critical if we want this to work from an international dimension. There's no two ways about it. Um, on the area around you're know, selling solutions in, and yes, absolutely, there's a lot of interest in this. One of the things that struck me, though, of course, from the from the certificate proposal itself is that this sits with the member states. The, the member states are the ones responsible to issue these certificates and they have to be issued free of charge. You know, so this is not something which is going to be necessarily farmed out to companies to to sell this and so forth, you know, because as a citizen in Europe, you're going to have a right to say, well, I want my certificate either to do with my testing results, to do with the existence of antibodies or to do with the fact that I've received a, a vaccination. And it has to be issued to you. That's going to be a right you're going to have under the regulation and can be enforced against a member state. So the, the customer here, I suppose, is, you know, well, the, the one who's going to be who has to come up with a solution for this and, and make sure that everybody receives it. It sits with the member state. There's also a question well, as well about the longevity of this whole process, because there's a sunset clause built into the mechanism or built into the proposal itself. The day that the WHO comes forward and says, there's no longer a pandemic, you know, it's no longer an area of global concern. Well, then the, the entire digital green certificate disappears. It unravels at that point. And that's been put in there because of concerns around fundamental rights and privacy in Europe as well. Now, we're still in proposal stage, but I would fully expect that sunset clause to make it through to the far side. So again, where are we in terms of a business around this as well, if potentially in a couple of years time, and let's be honest, we probably all hope that the pandemic ends sooner rather than later, the whole thing will disappear. So again, there is a question around profits, and perhaps, you know, given the member state's position on this, maybe it is about going for something along the non-profit line. But it, it maybe non-profit it facilitates free movement uh, and so on. But at some stage, intercontinental travel is, you know, subjective to should should that be free? You know, if you need additional requirements, when you need to travel. And certainly I see that um, some of the airline partners and stakeholders that we're dealing with are taking the longer view, saying in a 10 year view, will we have ebbs and flows of pandemic type situations? where we need to dial up and dial down our protections. And so we need to have capabilities where we don't switch off stuff and then have another massive disruption where we may not have a pandemic as big as COVID, but we may even a smaller outbreak of something in the future from a public perspective, perceptions will be heightened and awareness will be like, is this something happening again? And it'll have an impact on travel. Scott, what's your view on the whole nonprofit take on this? I mean, 
originally I, I, I felt that a, a non-profit organization would be the one to become the standard. Um, you know, and, and we probably all know the one I'm talking about. Um, but it's not worked out that way. I, I thought originally they would get enough government sponsorship. And my view was if you got enough governments on board, it would become the de facto standard and everybody would jump onto it. Because fundamentally, the most important thing is what the border guard is going to accept when you get across the border. And enough, gov enough countries accept a particular passport to get across the border, then it's, it's going to win. It's not played out that way. Um, it's clear now that there will be a range of different options. Um, you know, most of them private sector because, you know, there is an incentive to develop these things. I mean, they might sound horrible to say, but, you know, it's a market opportunity for the private sector to come in and, and fill the void. Um, and then it becomes, you know, to me, you know, what Chris, took, Chris was, was talking about earlier around interoperability, how do we get that common set of standards that will allow a number of different health passports, and they'll consolidate, no doubt, but allow a number of different passports to, to coexist and, um, you know, that data is, is shared and standards are shared. And I guess if you look at testing alone, we couldn't have left it up to a non-profit approach to testing because there's various needs for testing and different testing types and test innovation and so on. And, you know, the pandemic needs the greater body of resources coming to bear and commercial frameworks is usually the best way to get all that. And um, before we wrap it up, and I know we're going to run out of time, but there's like, let's talk about beyond airlines and uh, airports. So where else, like the cruises, you know, their business has been killed. Now there's a conditional... Um, sailing order coming out from the US and so on. Uh, what's the panel's view on that? Maybe starting with you, Maura. Um, where else do you see um, credentials being required in order to help some of these industries be, get back? I think all across the travel industry. You know, it's every, you know, when I think about travel as well, I think of events. You know, events is a big part of travel. People usually get a plane ticket to go somewhere to go to, you know, a football game, a concert, whatever it might be. So I think events are key, whether that be smaller conferences or bigger concerts, um, because that will just feed into more of the leisure travel too. Um, but even, I, I know some hotels are talking about, is there certain floors where we guarantee everyone on this floor has shown a credential? Um, you know, and I think, again, you know, unfortunately COVID is, one of those pandemics that it's a little bit classist as well, because it depends where you are in that kind of segment. Are you a luxury hotel or, you know, a kind of lower tier type hotel? And that's gonna be, you know, different across those types of brands. Um, but, you know, just rebuilding that trust, you know, for, for customers and for travelers, that's key. So many of the, of the stakeholders are looking at it at every single touch point. Um, just to have something that um, you know reinforces the trust, you know that you are in a space that's safe, you know that you you know you're on an airplane or wherever you might be. Uh, but definitely, I think a lot of the travel sellers are looking to it as just part of the journey. Very good. What do you think, Chris? Beyond uh, beyond airlines and airports, cruise lines, hotels, you know they all need their business back as well, right? So. I, I, look, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, again, we have to understand what, what is being developed and what's being discussed here as a tool. Do you know what I mean? And once that tool is available, then the question is just, well, where do we deploy it and where do we use it? Um, there is less consensus at a European level in terms of how far do we go with this? I think there's a broad acceptance around the importance from an international travel perspective. But once we go beyond that into sporting or cultural events, well, then some member states are very clear that that is something they want to explore and others are much more reserved in that regard. But again, I, I would think more so that once it exists, once people are using it in one facet of their lives, well, then the question begin, the question immediately surfaces, well, why can't I use this in another facet of my life as well? And I think there would be pressure then to try and use it in other spaces. So I definitely think it's something which potentially you know, we could see being used in other areas, particularly if we have some countries who are finding success with it, you know, because then those industries and those other countries that aren't using it will point to them and say, we should be doing the same thing. Or even, you know, apart from travel, think about the future of work, you know, so what if your office is in a WeWork building and you're sharing space with many different companies? So yeah, possibly even beyond travel. 
absolutely. But that. one thing, one thing it does that this does bring us to, and again, it, it, it again may be differentiation when we think about the digital green certificate in, in Europe and the approach they've taken there. But when we talk about you know vaccine passports or vaccine certificates, and it's more limited, that's where we get into an issue. And this is the concern about discrimination within society that services and and events and activities would be open to one group of people, but others who, for whatever reason, choose or are on able to receive a vaccine are then excluded from those activities. And that's something that, you know, people are very keen to avoid, of course, you know. Um, so again, we need to, it, you know, it's not just about the vaccines necessarily. It could be about testing, you know, uh, uh, pr procedures and testing mechanisms. It could be about the existence of antibodies. So this is where the, the European system that's being proposed at the moment is, is quite, it encompasses all of those elements. And again, it's when we talk about them, if we, if we restrict the conversation to purely about vaccines, then it can create a bit of a problem. You know? one, one last, uh, we've only got two or three minutes left, and I'm going to, a quick rapid fire round, uh, start with you, Scott. Can the summer be saved? I know we said earlier the summer is lost, but can the summer be saved? I'd like to think so, but I think it's going to be very difficult and it's going to be very patchy. You know, it, it will, you know, countries will go red, green, amber all the time. Um, unfortunately, that, that's, it's going to be a difficult year still. It's going to be a difficult year. Uh, Maura, what do you think? Parting comment. Can the summer be saved? Sorry, Clive, I think I lost you there for a second. Uh, yeah, sorry about the connection. Um, can the summer be saved? Um, I think potentially. I think definitely what I experienced yesterday, if we have, instead of it being one tenth of a plane full, if it's 90% full, and everyone has to walk up to a counter and stand in line and show their paperwork, it's gonna cause huge bottlenecks. Um, and people are not gonna to, going to go to the airport three or, four hour, three or four hours before they depart. So I think, um, you know, I think further collaboration, um, you know, obviously we all have to work together to stop the variants. Um, but I think with tools like Furfly, we will get to a better place and hopefully in time for the summer. Chris, I'm afraid we only have time for a yes, no, or maybe because we have to hand back to Alan. So can the summer be saved? Sadly, I'm going to fall on the side of no. I think, uh, oh, no. I, think public, I think the public health situation in Europe at the moment is, is extremely bad. And this is, this is tied to the vaccine rollout and there continues to be disruption on that front. It so is very tough. Personally, personally, I think, unfortunately, um, not the case this year. Well, Alan, uh, thanks very much for hosting this for us. Uh, and it is a very serious situation. Uh, so no summer holidays, Alan. Damn, I have to cancel my caravan in Bognor Regis. Um, for, but then we've got book for July. So here we go. So thanks to Clive and uh, all the panelists for making such a, an excellent session. Uh, we now have a break until 5 p.m. London time when, when we shall uh, round off an excellent day of discussion with the Fireside Chat. I shall be joined by Robin Bortz from Phoenixia when we shall be discussing why we need voice biometrics more than ever due to COVID-19, supporting touchless user identification and authentication. Thank you very much, guys, and we shall see you shortly. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.